My name is Rosie Goldsmith and welcome to my riveting interview series, Conversations with Authors from All Over the World. My nickname is Rosie the Riveter and one of my great passions is introducing readers to riveting writers. You may already know The Riveter, our magazine of international writing, as well as our online riveting reviews and riveting reads. They're all dedicated to giving foreign writers in English translation the prominence they deserve which is exactly what I want to do with this series of riveting audio and video interviews. They're all free via our website, eurolitnetwork.com. Welcome to today's riveting author. Today I'd like to introduce you to Antonia Lloyd-Jones. Now I've known Antonia a very long time and I admire her very, very much. So this is a chance for me to put Antonia in the spotlight. She is a translator from Polish. She's translated several of Poland's leading novelists and essayists, as well as crime fiction, poetry, children's books, and so on. And she is here going to be talking to us a little bit about Olga Tokarczuk, who she's translated. Um, but first of all, I want to talk to you about your life as a writer, because you have said <laughs> in the past, and several of your fellow translators have said the same thing, that you think a really good translator is first and foremost a good writer. Yes, I think the most important quality to become a good literary translator is to be very competent at writing in your own language. And you can do all sorts of courses and um, you can certainly learn things from other translators, but I, I feel that you need an innate writing skill and it helps to read a great deal as well and to constantly be exposing yourself to good writing whether in translation or in the original. Why did you choose Polish to translate? Because you studied Russian, uh, then, you, then you chose Polish. Well, if, uh, my answer to this question is always rather flippantly that the original reason why I learnt Polish uh, was um, six foot two with black curls and green eyes. Um, which then there's a lot of truth in that, but uh, it's very odd. I'd studied Russian, I'd spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, and just after graduating I went to Poland for the first time during martial law. So it was a grim time, and I had friends there, including the said tall gentleman, and I could see that these young people were concerned that their lives were just going to come to nothing in this country where they tried to rebel against the system, but it had all come, gone backwards. And the 80s were really a grim time in Poland. And their parents had had terribly difficult lives because of the war, and I mean, it's a long story, but they had, they had had to rebuild their lives from some terrible experiences. And so I remember coming home from that first trip thinking, aren't I lucky? I live in a place where I can do what I like and say what I like and have every possible opportunity. I'd like to help them and I made it a sort of a mission that somehow I could use my fortune to help. And at first I wanted to be a journalist, I was going to tell people about what was happening in Poland. But somehow through a series of accidents I ended up translating literature, which I, I'm happy with also as a way of telling English speakers about what's happening in Poland. In that way, you're describing translation as a mission, as uh, you're a crusader. Mm. Is that how you see yourself? I do feel, I mean, I love literature and that's the first reason why I do it. I mean, what could be more fun than doing something that's a bit like doing crossword puzzles all day long, playing with words, it's, it's great fun. But I do also feel that literature is very important to our mutual understanding and that reading books from all over the world really does tell you about those countries because experience is put into novels and I think it's very important for us to understand each other. We can't learn every single language and travel to every single country but we can certainly realise through literature that what we share and how very much we have in common. Also it's immensely entertaining and pleasurable. You're part of a wider community of translators into English. Mm. 
and you were also a mentor for emerging translators. You work very, very closely with, um, with, with particularly with, with new translators, and you travel a lot. You're, you know, you're constantly on this mission. Do you think the situation is better now for translated fiction? Recent statistics have shown that there has definitely been a rise in the sales of translated literature. And I would say that there's genuinely a lot more interest nowadays. And a lot of it is to do with the efforts of people, well, people like you, to promote um, translated literature and to found prizes, which are a useful focal point for casting light on foreign literature. Do you think that prizes like the EBRD Literature Prize, the Man Booker Prize International, prizes like that, do you think they have a, an impact on the sales and the popularity of foreign fiction in English translation? Yes, I think they do, because they allow booksellers to have something that they can promote. So if you have a, a long list and then a short list and then a winner, it gives booksellers and reviewers, newspapers, any kind of promotional and publicity outlets, something to focus on which is very good. And I always think it's really about all the books that are listed. It's not necessarily about the winning book. I totally agree. I mean, I love, I love the long lists, I love the short lists. And as chair of the judges for the EBRD Literature Prize, I find it really heartbreaking to ever have to choose a winner. Um, now, you have uh, translated uh, one of the, the winners, um, Olga Tokarczuk, who has also won the Man Booker Prize International. Tell me about Olga, tell me about her writing and, and why you love translating her. Oh, she's such a joy to translate. I've known Olga for a, about more than 20 years, I think. We've had a few adventures together. She's a remarkable person. Um, she is a prolific writer. She's produced a great deal. But you couldn't ever say that anything she writes is the same. She's very inventive not just with the stories she tells, but with the forms she uses and the approach she takes and the things that interest her. She's, she's quite a magpie. She'll pick up bits all over the place and make something incredible out of them. Interestingly, Olga is one of the few commercially successful uh, translated writers in, in, in English because it's, it, <laughs> we, we spoke about a surge, but it's still a tiny surge. Well, you say that, but it's taken a very long time for that to happen. And really, the stars have to align for, for that kind of success to happen. There is a big element of luck, because um, along with her other translator, Jennifer Croft, who translated Flights, that won the um, Man Booker International, um, we've spent years trying to get publishers to take notice of her when she's been doing better in other countries faster. And I translated two of her books quite a long time ago. And they got a bit of attention, but not what we'd hoped for at all. And then we had a big hiatus where we just couldn't get anyone interested. And we had publishers saying to us, well, this author's experimental. This was the terrible word that kept coming up. She never does the same thing twice. So I'm thinking, what do they want? They just want somebody who churns out the same book again and again. Um, but now that she's won this prize, oh, we love this experimental form. <laughs> so it's partly fashion, I don't know, just the zeitgeist or the moment, but also um, it's actually, again, to do with proper promotion because Poland was chosen as the market focus country for the London Book Fair in 2017. And that meant that a group of Polish writers were brought over here to have a lot of events. But it also meant that in the run-up, publishers were interested in producing Polish books in time for that book fair. And actually, that was a big help. So we had a good reason to, for her to have a lot of promotional events before the book fair, and then, and then uh, Fitzcarraldo uh, run, publisher. yeah, the publisher run by the wonderful visionary Jacques Testard, who really is a genius. Um, he made the correct effort and produced the book in time for the book fair. Um, so there we had something at the moment when there was a great deal of focus on Olga. Antonia, you've translated a lot of Polish literature. Um, 
tell me about the different different writers you've translated and <laughs> and and your favourite. I mean, you've translated crime writers, children's. Um. They're all my favourite. <laughs> I can't be partial, but um, I, I think I'm very very lucky because. Do you know how many books you've translated? Nope. I mean, it depends how you count it, because if you include the children's books, it's over 50. But um, I don't know. And then I sometimes think about all the short pieces I've translated, which would fill several <laughs> books. But um, it's very nice doing what I do and working with lots of different genres and lots of different authors, because it's like becoming somebody else every few months. It's a real luxury and, um, and a lot of fun. Now, Olga's not here in the room with us, but I feel she is. Um, let's just talk very briefly about this remarkable book. Um, this is the book um, that you and I are in love with. Um, it's one of many of Olga's books that I've read, but, and it's just fabulous. It is it is a crime novel, it's a novel about an extraordinary woman called Janina, and it's about rural Poland, it's about Catholicism, it's about hunting, it's about animals, it's about astrology, it's about William Blake. The title, mm -hmm. tell me about the title. The title is not spelled wrong, I hasten to point out. Drive your plow, P-L-O-W, <laughs> over the bones of the dead. The thing is that, um, in Britain, we've moved on, but the Americans haven't. That's how William Blake spelt the word plough. And that is a quotation from Proverbs of Hell, I think it's from. Because the book is full of... Each chapter starts with a, with a little motto taken from Blake. And they're all to do with animals. Because um, the main character in this book, she's very obsessed with Blake and rather influenced by him. And, and although it's set in the present day, this rather eccentric character, this woman in her mid-60s who lives in a small village in southwestern Poland in a very remote place, um, she speaks in a rather 18th century manner. And um, her prose is punctuated with odd capital letters, for instance. And um, she, one of her obsessions is William Blake. Um, another is astrology, as you mentioned, but her perhaps the, the most strongest driving force for Janina Dusheko is her love of animals and her wish to protect them, particularly from hunters. And the hunters are part of a tradition that usually involves rather macho males, let us say, um, who are part of a conservative Catholic culture that's very prevalent in Poland and not only in Poland. Um, and in the book, which as you said is a crime novel, there's a rather strange series of deaths that occur, occurs and um, in fact they're obviously murders. And Janina Dusheko is very interested in this and she keeps insisting to the police that these murders have been carried out by animals taking revenge on hunters. And as she's a woman of a certain age and clearly somewhat eccentric, they choose to ignore her, which, if you read the book, you will see that might just be an error. Antonio, you're going to read an excerpt from um, Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead. It's uh, been written by Olga Tokarczuk. It's published by Fitzcarraldo and translated by you. Now, as Oddball bustled about in his kitchen, I could see how tidily the glasses were lined up in his dresser and what a spotless cloth lay over the sewing machine. So he even had a sewing machine. As he fetched the teaspoons, for a brief moment, his drawer was revealed to me, and I couldn't tear my eyes away from it. It was wide and shallow like a tray. Inside, carefully arranged in separate compartments, lay all sorts of cutlery and other utensils needed in the kitchen. Each one had its place, though most of them were quite unfamiliar to me. It was hard to have a conversation with Oddball. He was a man of very few words, and as it was impossible to talk, one had to keep silent. It's 
hard work talking to some people, most often males. I have a theory about it. With age, many men come down with testosterone autism, the symptoms of which are a gradual decline in social intelligence and capacity for interpersonal communication, as well as a reduced ability to formulate thoughts. The person beset by this ailment becomes taciturn and appears to be lost in contemplation. He develops an interest in various tools and machinery, and he's drawn to the Second World War and the biographies of famous people, mainly politicians and villains. His capacity to read novels almost entirely vanishes. Testosterone autism disturbs the character's psychological understanding. I think Oddball was suffering from this ailment. <laughs> Antonia, thank you so much. Antonia Lloyd-Jones, thank, thank you. you very thank you. much. Thank you to today's riveting author. My name is Rosie Goldsmith and thank you for watching and listening to our riveting interview, Conversations with Authors from All Over the World. You can find our riveting interviews, reads and reviews on our website, eurolitnetwork.com.